Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, we're delighted to welcome you to another speaker from our speaker series at the Europe Center. Um, today, we're delighted to welcome Christian Bruning, who is a professor of comparative politics um, at the Department of Politics and Public Administration at the University of Constance. He has also held positions at the University of Toronto and the Max Planck Institute for the Study of Societies in Cologne, Germany. His research focuses on representation in public policy and advanced democracies, and it's been published in the leading journals um, of political science. He is a principal investigator at the Cluster of Excellence, the Politics of Inequality project, and directs the German Policy Agendas project, which is also part of the Comparative Agendas project. Um, this year, uh, we're very lucky because he is a fellow at the Center for um, Advanced Studies in the Behavioral Sciences, and we're delighted to welcome him today as he talks about how politicians think about inequality and the demand for redistribution. All right, um, so, and a lot of this research wouldn't be possible with all these people on, uh, on the board right now because it's uh, asking uh, politicians and doing interview in politicians first, we did in six countries and now we're doing it in 14 advanced democracies from Canada, lots of Western Europe, Australia, um, and some um, kind of East uh, European countries too. I think the better title for my talk would have been um, Politicians Don't Change Their Mind on Redistribution, but that's probably uh, not a good title to broadcast if you are interviewing politicians, uh, but that's what I am going to go today. And I think there's through three takeaways for you from the talk. The first one, politicians are different, but they're human too, and that kind of sucks. And what I mean by that is um, that just the ascriptive traits in terms of gender, age, and so forth uh, is very different from the general population. And that has um, redistributive uh, consequences because typically older, more well-off uh, people, uh, male, are to, uh, in, in the kind of broader population typically uh, adverse to redistribution. And so just the kind of descriptive comp uh, composition of uh, legislators works against mm -hmm. it. The second point is that really just as citizens, they use ideology and other heuristics when making decisions about redistributions. And I'm gonna talk about uh, two of them, ideology in particular and projection. And um, sometimes these kind of cognitive tools work uh, and you make good decisions, sometimes they can lead you astray. And what I'm gonna show you is because of their ideological commitments, they're gonna have a hard time to uh, kind of understand how inequality changes over time and judge whether it's fair or unfair. And because of projection, so uh, using their own opinion to think about what their voters want, they have a hard time picking up what the voters actually want, uh, what kind of redistribution preferences exist in the, in the general public. And so given one and two of these things, it's unlikely that redistribution is gonna happen in Europe and elsewhere in the, in the coming years is, which, uh, is my argument here. And so typically when politicians talk about, uh, think about a policy problem, they ask themselves uh, for it. The first question, is there a problem? And then the second one, do, what do voters want to do about it? And that's what I'm gonna talk about explicitly today. So did they really think that um, inequ economic inequality increased over the last 20 or 30 years in Europe? And um, did they think it's fair or unfair? And then um, what do they think the voters want to be done about if they have that conviction? And I'm gonna use um, data from interviews from about 850 uh, legislators who are sitting in parliaments uh, in Europe, in Canada, so five countries, uh, most of the data is just before uh, the um, COVID pandemic started. Um, unfortunately, I thought I'm gonna show you some more experimental design from recently where we do it in 15 countries, um, but I'll hold back on that and I can show you in the Q&A some of that data too. But before you get into it, I want you, if you have your cell phone here, and stop eating for a second and uh, do a quick survey. So 
It's not that you have to earn your lunch. So thank you for participating. And if somebody asks me about it, I can show you how you guys did and how other people did. I'll get back to it um, because we ask exactly the same question to some of the legislators in our, in our survey. Okay, so I guess uh, let's start with kind of the story so far. Um, the story so far is that uh, many advanced democracies, as all of you know, experienced a rise in economic inequality and in income and wealth since the 1970s. Uh, Atkins and other economists kind of documented um, that trend, and it's particularly pronounced um, in kind of starting in the late 70s, early 80s. And um, it kind of with the 2000 crash really brought it to uh, into kind of the public uh, domain with the Occupy movement and the fallout of the financial crisis, uh, obviously. Typical political economy models like Melissa Richard or others or models of democratic politics more broadly would say, well, if uh, we have this rise in inequality, then we would expect uh, voters would respond to that and ask for more redistribution. But it hasn't really happened, right? So the political science research in the last, I think, 10, 15 years then thought about, well, if there's this increase in inequality, why didn't it happen? And basically so far they've uh, given us two answers. Um, so the first one um, is, well, voters don't get it, right? So voters don't uh, really demand redistribution because they misrepresent their preferences, because they're distracted by kind of cultural dimension of politics. Um, they miscalculate, they think they might be rich in the future. So really like a lot of blame was kind of put on the voters and um, the classical uh, article that really started that was in 2005, uh, kind of uh, uh, Larry Bartel's work. So, so that was kind of one answer, right? So voters just don't get it. The second kind of answer was, well, voters get it, but these representational linkages that we know are broken. So something is not working in the way that democracy is supposed to be uh, set up. Um, the rich have a say, the poor are ignored. There's these inequalities in representation that then lead to distorted uh, policy outcomes. And for the US case, uh, uh, Hacker Pearson's work, as well as Marty Gillen's kind of, uh, 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 kind of the modern classics um, of this kind of logic, right? And so what all of those um, things have in common is it's really a question of demand for redistribution. It goes from voters up to uh, parliaments and ask, and that's kind of the representational linkages that we think about. But what do politicians think about that? So this is uh, from a budget debate uh, 2016 in Germany, where uh, Angela Merkel, the uh, chancellor said, people in Germany have never done better than at the moment. About 15 minutes later, uh, opposition party, uh, Sarah Wagenknecht of the Linke said, in Germany, social inequality and uncertainty is increasing. So both of say, those things can be obviously correct, but it points us to a different kind of uh, logic that might be going on. And that it's really about the supply of these policies. So the so political responses to economic inequality is one gonna be my, kind of my overarching argument depends on the supply of redistributive policies. And it's really how politicians evaluate these inequalities and how they estimate kind of voter demand for redistribution. So is the world in a terrible shape and I should do something about it and do voters uh, reward me for, uh, for doing something on issue. And that's what we're uh, gonna go here. And I'm gonna start uh, you to tell a little bit about who are these people who are sitting in parliaments in Europe. And so this is Belgium, Canada, Germany, Netherlands, and Switzerland. That's where we have the first wave of data in, um, in about 2016, 2017. And I'm gonna compare the distribution of um, 
kind of different ascriptive traits of this population to those uh, who are sitting in parliament. And then I just see uh, percent point differences. So over 60 uh, years old in differences um, right now, um, surprisingly then in this sample there, the population is about five, six, nearly 10%, I guess, um, has more um, elderly people than people sitting in parliament. But um, if you look it, at the actual ages, um, it is actually a pretty uh, good match between what's going on in the situation in, in the population in the parliament. When you look at males, then you already see about uh, 20%, uh, so 70% male uh, MPs are sitting in parliament where it's about 50 uh, uh, in the, or 48 in the population in most of these cases. So males are largely overrepresented in parliaments than they are um, in uh, compared to the population average. And then university ob uh, education, obviously nearly 70% uh, uh, higher share of university education compared to the general population. So nearly everybody in parliament uh, is uh, university educated by 2016, not that in these countries, uh, obviously it's about 20 to 30%, depending on the country. Um, in, in the broader population. And if you look at other uh, ascriptive traits, uh, which are harder to measure, being foreign born or having a, a migrant background, there's a mismatch is even, uh, is even bigger, right? These are vastly underrepresented in parliament. A, a potential problem then emerges that all these traits are usually associated with being uh, opposing redistribution. And so these are uh, the, the legislators that we are talking about, there is obviously this difference between kind of the, the descriptive uh, traits that we have that can be uh, problematic and is particularly problematic um, when uh, you think there are particularly grievances uh, in society, which might not be the case or not that stark in the case uh, of these democracies about redistributive problems, but the bigger problem might be in substantive representation, right? If these people representing the situation hold these very strong views and have preferences that are uh, against uh, redistributive policies, given their trade, then might, we might have a substantive representation problem. But in order to kind of tease that out, we need a uh, behavioral uh, level evidence. So a lot of political science basically stopped there and that well, these matches, it, it, they don't match on these traits, therefore representational linkages might be broken. But we actually don't know uh, quite uh, well how, how these individual uh, level uh, behavioral uh, predilections uh, exist. So, uh, and I'm gonna focus on two, and the first one is ideology and how that's gonna make, uh, um, um, make you choose among redistributive policies and very broadly, there's a huge debate in political science what ideology is. There was an article, I think from Gehring from 1999, it's basically says we can't define it, but I'm just gonna say it kind of serves as a kind of coherent system of beliefs that guide our policy choice. So very broad, uh, definition and uh, by having this very broad belief that especially for politicians, they often, uh, and we know that from the Michigan schools that you inquire your ideological belief during kind of childhood adolescence and uh, they're not particularly um, flexible in that way. And um, this you, you use as kind of as a lens of seeing the world in a particular way. And you see the world in a particular way when it comes to uh, short-term economic evaluations or your ideology of, uh, affects whether you see the economy is doing well. We know that from citizens. Um, there's also this uh, research on partisan motivated reasoning in the last um, 20 years or so from, uh, from citizens that uh, it limits your adjustment to new and conflicting information. And um, recent work shows that it also kind of affects your assessment of uh, inequality and redistribution. So um, all these pointers point out that ideology is gonna have kind of a bite on what your preferences um, gonna have. So 
these beliefs are structured kind of as a partisan commitment to one or the other ideology, which we often simply call kind of as left and right. So this partisan identity for politicians, just as maybe like extreme partisans is tied to these belief systems and to, if you look into the political psychology literature, to kind of moral judgment and justification of the system the way it's set up. And so for the left, and that goes back, you can go back in the 60s to Darendorf, uh, Gramson and so forth. There's this desire for equality and they are typically seen as seekers of social change. Um, they're sympathetic for, for the poor. And when it comes to uh, kind of how people get uh, ahead in life, they stress luck over merit. So rightist ideology says there's a huge desire for a stability. You justify the system as it is, and thereby you're trying to avoid social change. Um, there is indifference uh, for the poor, and that's partly due to the ideas that really merit uh, gets you ahead in life uh, instead of luck. So there's these ideological differences that uh, have that changes your outlook to the world and makes uh, allows you to make judgments, but it also uh, helps you to kind of justify the choices that you're made. And so the expectation then when it comes for redistribution is that um, the more ideologically left a politician is, then they are more likely to perceive uh, inequality is growing given these uh, views that they have and that they're more likely to perceive uh, these inequalities as being unfair. So this is kind of how they're gonna evaluate the world around them uh, when they see inequality. On the other side, when it comes to how they're gonna evaluate what voters tell them, um, we know kind of from the broad comparative politics literature that kind of there are two ways of uh, how to get politicians' attention. So one is an election. So uh, if you perform, perform fully uh, in an election, you're replaced by somebody else. Or if you wanna stay in, government, you're trying to anticipate public opinion. And so both these mechanisms, throwing people out who don't uh, pay attention to voters and those who pay attention to voters staying in, that kind of ensures that government are resp responsive to what the voters really want. And there's a long literature in political science that kind of uh, argues uh, in different ways that constituency preferences uh, are matched by uh, the legislator and the legislator is kind of able to follow what their voters want. And this comes mostly out of the American literature, but it's also then, um, of course, institutions are kind of uh, worked in there, but it, uh, there's good reasons, um, also under different mechanisms that it also works in parliamentary democracy. And more recent literature though so that, well, there are also these biases in perception of uh, public opinion that come out um, that maybe uh, their diff responsiveness uh, differs uh, when voters have different kind of ascriptive trait, be it ethnicity or gender or wealth. So they pay attention to some voters uh, over others and that kind of fed into this kind of second logic of, uh, of why nothing has happened. But what all of those uh, models uh, have in common, that it's really up to the legislator to kind of obtain process and then kind of retrieve the information that helps them to make the judgment call. What do voters want? Um, and how do I, how much freedom of uh, movement do I have in my own opinion? Or do I really uh, need to listen to them, right? So it's really legislators need to read their environment in some way and then determine okay, that's what the voters want, that's what I want, here's some room that I have to move, and uh, how responsive do I need to that information coming from the voter. But kind of in cognitive, uh, uh, cognitive psychology and political psychology, we know that kind of most of these situations happen in kind of an information rich environment. So, uh, and to cut through all the information uh, going back to Tversky, of course, um, you, you, you need some simple rules to cut through it, right? They're bombarded by information from interest groups, from voters all the time. So they need some simple tools to allow them to make this judgment call. And one simple tool is uh, you just use your own opinion for making a judgment about the popularity of choices. And this is uh, 
it doesn't necessarily have to be misleading. In a lot of cases, it works just fine, right? Especially if you maybe have similar background as your, as your voters. And um, other use of heuristics like availability of information that's on top of their head has been uh, already documented in political science and comparative politics more broadly. But if you use uh, your own opinion uh, uh, to make this judgment basically means if you prefer a certain option, then you believe you have a majority of uh, other people believe this, uh, this, uh, this option too. And it was first documented by Ross and Kruger when they asked um, students about what their favorite pizza parlor is. And they believed that everybody likes the same kind of pizza. And it was replicated in a lot of different settings in psychology. And so that's called the false consensus effect. That people have the tendency to see, believe that their own choices is also liked by a lot of other people. And so politicians fall prey to the same kind of effect. And they might be particularly easy to be affected by that. And one of the reasons why they meet, might be easily affected by that, that typically is surrounded by like-minded politicians who maybe hold very similar views. So there's a heightened danger that they fall uh, prey to this kind of, uh, of thinking. But what we get out of that is then, when you ask a politicians where they believe public opinion lies, they use kind of their own opinion as a yardstick for it. So the expectation that I'm gonna tell you about is that kind of legislators own opinion on redistributive policy is associated with their assessment uh, for the demand of redistribution. So you project your own opinion on that on the public. And this might be bad, it might be good, it might be a helpful tool, maybe successful politicians are better, uh, have like a better reading in this regard, um, but it's definitely one of those uh, things that you can use. Okay, so let me uh, tell you a little bit on how we did that. So as I said, um, the data I'm, I'm gonna show you is from like 2016, 2017, 2018, shortly before uh, the COVID outbreak and it's about uh, 850 legislators in these five countries. And typically, and that's why we needed so, uh, so many collaborators, you just uh, have to have uh, the manpower to, uh, to get something like that off the ground. And typically there were face-to-face -face interviews. In the German case, they lasted about half an hour to, uh, to 45 minutes, where we set them down. Um, gave them uh, a laptop and do like 15 minutes of survey. And then we have kind of structured questions um, um, where we ask them in open-ended format where they could respond kind of in a classical interview setting and we transcribe them um, afterwards. And so um, response rates of how, how many politicians participated varies a lot across countries. In Belgium, everybody, every MP is still in the phone book with that regular address. Um, you know, it's a two hour drive uh, at the most to visit them at home. So participation rates uh, were in the 90, 90%. So nearly all of them, including the prime minister participated at the time. Um, in Germany, which is about over 700 people sitting in parliament, um, it was uh, a lot more challenging to contact them and there, but it also kind of goes with expected response rate was about 25 to 28%. And um, what it usually then entailed is um, that it takes about 20 hours to do one interview. So from start, from contact exam, writing letter, getting through uh, their office, actually landing on the desk of the MP to make a decision on it. Um, that was uh, for each one of them that we did was about 20 hours if you go back for it. But the good thing about it is that it uh, is kind of representative with regard to party. Um, so in Germany, we use the sampling strategy in the smaller countries with just 150 or so legislators that just ask everybody, gender, incumbency, and so forth. And also kind of political office. So we have ministers and so forth in the sample too, and not just backbenchers. Okay, so that's how it um, how it went, and uh, I forgot to say, feel free for questions of uh, clarification. Interrupt me at any time. Let me just tell you um, for these countries that I'm going to talk about how inequality uh, looked in the last twenty years, because we're going to ask them the question: Did inequality change uh, in the last twenty years? And this is just the market uh, Gini uh, coefficient, and I'm going to plot in the U.S as an example. So as you see US, it uh, formed like um, 
1998 to 2018, it markedly increased, um, but it that didn't happen in all of those countries. So in the Netherlands, it was pretty flat, and then there was a big jump after, uh, right after the financial crisis in terms of inequality. It remained pretty flat in Belgium. Uh, in Germany, it, it actually the inequality increase happened before, already before uh, the market crash of 2000. I you, uh, connected probably kind of to Schroeder agenda 2010, uh, as well as a poor economy during that time. And uh, it's a lot lower in Switzerland. You know, everybody is rich in Switzerland, uh, but it's still kind of uh, uh, increased a little bit. So they have, we have very different outcomes in Canada. Uh, actually, since 2015, it kind of fell, right? So in some countries, it's, there was no change. In some countries, it's in, increased a long time ago, and, and legislators might have forgotten. In other cases, it, it might have been more recent. And in, in Canada, it's actually dropped, right? So we have all kinds of varieties of what actually happened in the world. None of these varieties matter. So politicians do not have a really hard time of uh, agreeing on like the facts on the ground. So if you look at cross countries, um, these effects in actual market inequality did not uh, trigger any particular response um, in, in any of this way. What instead matters really was uh, ideology. And I'm gonna show you that. So the first one we ask according to your opinion, uh, do you have the differences in income between uh, the rich and the poor households in your country changed in the 20 years? A lot of people, a majority say they, uh, you know, over 60% say that, well, they are rather larger or uh, they are larger, right? So a uh, large majority of politicians believe that uh, inequality actually uh, did increase if you just look at it. And then uh, would you say these differences in income uh, in your country are fair or unfair? And again, it's about 50-ish uh, percent, not quite, uh, who say they are unfair and they are rather unfair. Not many people believe, not many legislators believe, uh, so about 4% uh, four, four say, well, they're totally fair and close to 20 say they are rather fair, right? So it typically doesn't matter which country, uh, people, politicians believe it increased in the last 20 years and it's um, and uh, it is rather unfair. But let me show you how uh, kind of ideology is uh, coloring this assessment. And so here I have, and this is from uh, the very left um, legislators to, to the very right, and I'm going to put you so you can scale it in your head uh, on there. Uh, so the Democrats uh, to the Democratic Party, uh, the American was about here in 2016, and Republicans are out there. So there's legislators from like some uh, very right-wing Swiss parties over here, and there are some kind of near communist essentially parties, very leftist parties over here, right? And so then when we ask, when we predict the probabilities of inequality, so if we look at those who say much larger, then we say we can say that for a person who is very leftist, there's a 50% chance, at least a 50% chance uh, that he says uh, it, it's, uh, it's larger. And as you move to the right, it kind of decreases, right? So uh, it, becoming more right means less likely that you're gonna say um, these inequalities um, are increased. For, uh, for uh, smaller, so the other end of the extreme, if you move from left to right, uh, some legislators on the right say, well, yeah, actually it's smaller now than it was before. And you can do that with the middle categories too, you add those, and then you get the complete picture where you can see that leftists on average are saying, well, compared to 20 years ago, or there's a high probability that leftist politicians say, uh, inequality increased. On the right, there's a lot of uncertainty, right? So there some, the most common response is uh, they're rather smaller, so that is the highest probability. So leftist politicians in this sample, doesn't matter how inequality actually looked like, uh, say it increased, right is it might've increased, might've decreased, we are not quite sure. Right? Um, when it comes to, um, 
to how, whether they see it, oops, whether they see it as as fair or unfair. Again, looking at leftists, say, well, there's a 70% chance that if you're a leftist uh, legislator, you're gonna say it's totally unfair, right? And as you move to the right, uh, your probability of saying unfair is going play, it's close to zero. And they, the opposite is true for conservative uh, politicians. So about there's about 50% chance for conservative politicians that you're gonna say it's a fair deal if inequality increases. And so this is nearly symmetric, right? If you're a centrist, your most likely response is it's neither fair nor unfair. You're quite un uncertain about that. And it, so, and these are the other kind of smaller categories. So uh, what we can take away from that, if politicians think about uh, economic inequality and how it changed in the last 20 years, leftist politicians say, well, it, is, it increased and it's totally unfair. Politicians on the right say, we don't know what happened, but it doesn't matter because it would be fair anyway, right? So that is, uh, so that is, a, that is a power of ideology when they think about um, how the economy changed in Europe in the last 20 years. Okay, then let's move to uh, the question of how they look uh, at voters. And here, um, that is just the estimate of, um, of public support for redistribution. And so we have a bunch of policy questions, just like the ones you answered, four or five of them uh, in each country. You know, should we increase uh, retirement age? Should we do more redistribution of income and wealth and so forth? And so legislators' position is totally disagree. So he's totally against redistribution and he's totally for redistribution, right? Then we look, what do they think, what voters in general think? And it looks nearly the same for voters for their party. And so if you are totally against redistribution as a legislator, do you believe that about 44% of the population is, uh, is for redistribution? So a majority of citizens are also against redistribution. But if you are on the other hand, totally for uh, redistribution as, as your own position, you estimate that about 64% of the population are for it. So there's a huge disconnect. It's a nearly 20% point in how you think demand for redistribution happens in the population. So if you ask a politician, do voters want redistribution? You get very different answers from a politician depending on what his own position is, right? And so this is all, uh, this, and this is, uh, there's a huge, uh, that is a huge kind of effect, right? To be 20% off, it's uh, to be off to whether it's a majority or minority who's for it. And so that really kind of binds political uh, choices and action in that way. Okay. Uh, and I'm just going to skip that. It, it, it comes out in, in other models. And so for the Belgian politicians, we then ask them, um, why, what do you think, why you have, why, you, why this projection happens? So um, why do you think, uh, uh, is it so hard to, to estimate uh, public opinion on it? And here are some of the answers. So the first mechanism they mentioned is, one of them said, well, estimating public opinion is difficult because what the public thinks often does much your own opinion. And that's hard to accept and it's the reason that you're often mistaken. So he is kind of aware of that in the continuing in the interview, he kind of asked us to like how we can help them to, to uh, make these adjustments. Um, another um, tendency that came up is kind of exposure to skewed information environments. And so one of them said, uh, people have a natural tendency to listen more carefully to people who are close to them, both ideologically and in terms of their background. Often you're just sitting in your own bubble surrounded by your kind of people, right? So that's another way. And then the third one to kind of top it all off, you, it's really hard for a politician to make an adjustment uh, and reach out other kinds of information. So uh, one of them even admitted and said like, I'm aware that the people I'm getting feedback from are mainly supporters. Few people that I meet at food events or markets tell me they dislike what I do. They mostly confirm my position. Politicians should know that the signals they are not 
they are, get, are not representative. It's naive not to reweigh these signals. And so these are kind of the politicians themselves reflecting on why it is so hard to, to follow um, public demand. And as kind of a, as a last step, uh, let me show you that um, the way politicians think, so now we just basically measured attitudes of what they privately believe. And so what I wanna do in the last step, think about does it actually make a difference of how they're acting? And uh, because it's really hard in parliamentary democracies to figure out what individual politicians do because partisan organization in the legislature is very strong. Uh, one way to get at it, uh, besides Twitter or social media, of course, which is heavily loose, is actually speeches. So speeches kind of as kind of the principal individual form of political action in parliamentary democracy, where they go to parliament and they give a, a speech on a topic. And so that's kind of a scar opportunity to express this kind of strongly held perception. Obviously in the literature, so there's some strategic element involved in, in who they're gonna show, but we're gonna use these speeches for kind of highlighting individual concerns. And so the expectation is that uh, this perception of rising inequality leads to kind of more inequality related speeches. So we are matching um, the politicians who filled out the survey and kind of observe what they did in parliament and what did they end up talking about as a topic. And uh, we, we are able to do that in Canada and in Germany. And as you kind of see uh, inequality related topics. And so we looked at all the speeches I give in this legislative term uh, right before we did the interview. Um, it's not about of all the uh, MPs that we were able to match, about a quarter of them uh, gave speeches on um, inequality. In the Canadian sample, it was uh, close to 40% in the German sample. So during the time, collectively for all, uh, let for in the whole, the legislature as a whole, it was a bigger issue in Germany than it was uh, in Canada. But then if you match these kind of individual perceptions, or if you, and that is a very common case, well, if you don't think it's, uh, it, they are smaller and uh, inequality didn't increase and you just don't even talk about it, right? So none of the Canadians did and just one of the uh, people in, in Germany talked about it. But as you move up and see that inequality increased, you see it's, uh, on this scale, it's not particularly visible, but it basically in the Canadian case, it shifts from about 10% of your speeches to about um, yeah, 25% of the speeches if you move up. So 10% 10, 10 point increase and even bigger in Germany. So uh, if, you are, if you think that inequality increased, if you perceive that as a problem, a problem that became uh, more prevalent over the last year, that is probably a good, uh, thing for democracy, politicians seem to actually acting on it and talk about it in parliament. Okay, so um, let me quickly sum it up. Um, what I uh, want to do or what I want you to take uh, home with you today is kind of perceptions of inequality. What really matters is politicians do not share the view on the dynamics of inequality, nor its fairness. And their perception and the moral assessment is driven by ideology. That's the kind of the first part. So uh, not, by the, not as much by the real world as you would think. And then perception about voter demand. Um, it's really about having your own personal preferences that kind of, uh, they project that onto the popularity of support for government intervention. So um, this perception of economic inequality, voter, uh, demand and redistribution is uh, rather sticky. It doesn't matter so much how the world changes or what voters think about it. Politicians are fairly set in their uh, take on redistributive policies and ideology uh, is kind of sitting in the background and driving that. And the problem with that of course is, well, if on the one hand uh, you believe as a politician who is against redistribution that nobody supports it anyway, and if you're a politician who uh, is strongly for redistribution, that uh, you have uh, the majority behind you, then kind of this disagreement among politicians uh, might stymie action. It might not come from the changing world. It might not come from what voters want, but it might come from your own kind of preconceived notion of how the world 
uh, looks like. And that was gonna make political change kind of hard. Um, and then just kind of as a kind of a speculative kind of uh, implication. Um, so Marx and Engels throws the ideas of ruling class are in every epoch, uh, uh, in every epoch, the ruling ideas. And so one of the things we ask them, do you see yourself as a delegate or a trustee? And what we mean by that, a delegate is a representative who just follows public opinion. So you follow your voter, what they tell you, right? You're delegated to do something. And the trustee is uh, more this model um, and goes back to Burke, I guess, um, where we can, where you put them in place and they make reasonable ch uh, choices for all of the voters. And so legislators themselves in these five countries, a large majority of them, uh, they believe they are trustees. So they are, they are not delegated to implement public wishes. They are there to make reasoned choices and explain them to the public. And so it, that makes it even more important to think about how politicians think about kind of it, in my case, kind of economic problem, but I think uh, more, prob more importantly, like all problems of the day, because how they think about it is going to guide their action. And so, um, um, so politicians as script is right, don't measure those citizens really. That's what I showed you, kind of eco actual economic inequalities don't affect these political preferences. Instead, uh, ideology and other uh, heuristics guide those choices. So um, what we can learn from that too is that probably small changes in su supply for redistribution and there are kind of two potential avenues how we can change the supply for redistribution. Basically, it's ideological replacement. So if you take out a lot of conservative uh, legislators and reduce uh, the vote shares of conservative parties, then you increase the likelihood that we get policy making on it. Um, that is kind of really up to the voter. Then the other avenue is, um, and that goes to the heuristic, somehow we need to figure out to increase the visibility of kind of poor voters demand. And I can show you uh, other uh, research that we have done with them. Uh, legislators are particularly off the mark when they think about kind of the lower half of the income in distribution and what they really want. So what are the ways in terms of uh, getting uh, poor voters heard by politicians uh, more regularly? That is, I think, one way where we can uh, intervene. Of course, as I kind of alluded to already, there's this kind of looming danger of polarization of conflict if both sides, left and right, believe that they have a majority behind them on redistribution. It's gonna be hard to, uh, to figure out and that kind of will probably lead if these cognitive drivers uh, are really driving that to very rarely happening that we have this kind of collective reassessment of the situation, but then that might mean lead to kind of rapid and transformative change. I'll leave it with that. Thank you for your attention and happy to take questions. We have about 15 minutes for questions. Um, Stop, or we right. Um, so I have a question. It's maybe a very Belgian question um, about regional differences. So yeah. I was wondering whether you looked at uh, regional differences. Uh, some of the countries that are included in the in the five uh, that you have studied so far yep. are very divided in terms of in income inequality. Also, some of them uh, ethnically very divided. Uh, maybe it's not a coincidence also that uh, in the graph of the evolution of inequality that the two outliers, I would say, not just in this group of five, but I think more in general are Canada and uh, Belgium that sort of uh, are constantly on the brink of uh, falling apart. Yeah. So I was wondering whether that also had an impact on how politicians think about this, uh, on their perception, their attitudes, uh, the outcomes also. Yeah, no, that's a very good uh Question: So two cases where we looked closely in it, and partially because our Belgian collaborators believe that it's two countries, Belgium by now anyway, uh, because party systems are structured totally differently and so forth. And so there we looked closely, and then um, in the Swiss case too. And so, and there we can still see that like ideological politicization washes these regional differences away which is surprising to some extent because you would think, especially then like uh, on the second part of the questions where you go to like voters demands for redistribution, you would 
think that if you're in a smaller country with smaller constituency, you're closer to your voters, you're a better judge of, uh, of public opinion and you're, you're making best est better estimates. And also that is not the case at all. So uh, for the Swiss case in particular, we have uh, across all the different um, cantons, well, of six of those cantons, we have uh, representatives in the sample and they don't do better than the nationally elected in the Belgian case. Uh, it's the same case where we have some ministers in there who are not elected, and, uh, but they're just uh, being uh, put in the place and they don't do better or worse than those who are elected. So kind of the electoral system doesn't seem to bite surprisingly. Yeah. Right. Uh, thank you for that great talk. I really enjoyed that. I have actually three questions for you. <laughs> so the first one is, do you think that over time this consensus effect has become worse? Because I mean, like we now just, uh, politicians are now just not surrounded by like-minded party members. We also have social media where we have those filter bubbles and echo chambers even more. So and of course the like-minded voters follow you and you get even kind of more feedback loops where you kind of get the same. And rationalize what you are doing. So if I'm a party member of the left party, um, I will kind of, uh, of course, defend my redistributional um, uh, course of, because that's my party's cause. I've been socialized into that. And so I go on with that. And the last one, do social demographics make any difference? Do you see differences between female and male politicians, older and younger politicians uh, in terms of those kind of um, consensus effects um, and yeah, the, how much ideology matters? That happens for leftist parties who think uh, public opinion is more in the middle, and for the voters and the general public, as well as for, for rightists, right? Right parties think uh, that their voters are even more right um, than they actually are. And so we, we confronted them with that finding uh, in kind of the, in the service, um, in the interviews. And first of all, there was like blanket denial, you know, like say they know better, they really say, hey, it was a strong belief, you showed them the numbers, saying like on average you're 20% off your estimate of public opinion. And uh, they, wouldn't be, they wouldn't believe it. And then we kind of uh, kept poking uh, and say, when we asked them for mechanisms and two things came up. One of them was the heightened use of social media that, uh, that yeah, I know I shouldn't do it, but I always check Twitter. I ask somebody to check Twitter and so forth. Uh, and the role of interest groups was still, was, was um, always brought up to, you know, as two of those mechanisms why maybe these projections change and as these interview quotes show, it's like they are aware of it, but they really struggle to, to make the necessary adjustment. I think they, they don't have, I think, enough voices, especially kind of from the poorer parts of the population of what their preferences are, and to factor that in. So they don't even know. I think there's a lot of uncertainty where they are, especially for, uh, I think, rightist parties where there's this politician, political competition on kind of the socioeconomic, but also on the cultural dimension. So they are so focused on this cultural dimension, a lot of these right-wing parties by now, that they totally are uncertain where their voters lie on this kind of uh, left and right, bread and butter uh, kind of dimension. Um, yeah. Why are they doing it? That's a good, uh, good question. Um, besides, it's hard to me to talk about incentives, right? Because this representational mechanism should work. It's like you're doing something wrong uh, here. Eventually it potentially costs you voters, but I don't necessarily want to go there because uh, you know, I think misjudgment matters for 
for policy, it doesn't necessarily matter for representational questions, whether you're, you just need to believe you have a majority, it doesn't matter whether you're five point off or 10% or point off. So in that way, it's not that harmful to be a little, in a little bit off. Um, and I think that's how they go about it too. Um, and then, so all these other, well, that was this graph I skipped. So maybe I'll just go back to, to that. So in their assessment, um, education doesn't matter. <laughs> Gender doesn't matter. Age doesn't matter at all. So these are all, uh, so this was all pre-registered. These are all uh, null filings and your perception of reality doesn't seem to uh, come out either. So there's no effect in terms of uh, whether women are uh, better estimates uh, of public opinion than men, whether younger are better, um, whether educated, I mean, a lot of university degree, most of them are university educated. Um, in other work, we also show backbenchers or being party leaders, doesn't matter, you are equally bad. And I can show you maybe a graph how bad people actually are. Uh, So this is how bad they are. So we gave someone like 15 topics, not just redistribution I'm now talking about, to ask them where public opinion is. And it's really, that's the inaccuracy in percent points. So if somebody says, if public opinion is at 50% and they guess it's at 70%, it would be here, right? And that's about where the majority of people are. So they really don't know where majorities and minor, uh, are in, in, on a lot of those issues. So they have a really hard time doing it. And so, and that is an, an, an forthcoming APSR where we basically show that none of these factors that we believe, like electoral system, competitiveness of elections, make people better or worse judges. The best one in all of those was a rural Bavarian uh, CSU. MP, and we don't know why, you know, we like asked him in the second round and he gave the same uh, interview responses to uh, interest groups and social media matter. And it's really uh, astonishing, uh, but a puzzle nevertheless. In, uh, in your work, I had a question about what is really meant by public support of redistribution. In the United States context, uh, we have had more polarization because legislative districts have been gerrymandered and divided up so that, uh, in essence, there is more ideology within the, within each district than the legislators, of course, don't care about what the general public in a broad area uh, yeah. think about redistribution. They care about what people who vote for them think about redistribution. Yeah. So therefore, you, it, the, their view on redistribution reflects the ideology of the majority of their constituents. So when you ask the legislators in your surveys yeah. about public support, were they thinking about public support in their geographic area uh, or were they discussing uh, it overall? Yeah, 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 and that is a that is a tricky question, particularly because we have different countries in there, like Canada, where we have basically the same system as in the US, but also uh, the Netherlands, where the whole country is one electorate. So there it, it works totally fine, right? So, so they are asking about general public opinion is asking in a simple district um, about public opinion. And so um, one way we are trying to address that a little bit is uh, by also asking about their own voters. And so, and, th and there's the things look exactly uh, like they do here. So they are equally bad as uh, at estimating kind of general public opinion and estimating public opinion among their voters. And they're particularly, particularly bad at estimating public support among the poor parts of their voters, which is unbelievable. Yeah. Um, if we turn, turn it upside down and if we try to find like what would be the perfect moment in history or the perfect place, where the results would have been very different and you know everybody would be in favor of actually doing something about 
uh, about that. Where do you think we would be and in what country we would be? That's an interesting thought experiment. What's a perfect counterfactual um, would be. I mean, one way we are trying to address this to some extent is just going to more countries in a different time space. So now we are doing the same kind of question five years later in for 15 countries um, and see whether having different political systems, having different kind of backgrounds in economic uh, inequalities, whether that really changes anything. Uh, but so far, the, the problem is it, it, we, it, did, it didn't seem to matter, right? Looking at those five countries, how it looks out, how it looks out. So it would be some place where we don't have ideology and we don't, what would be that? Where would we find a place like that? I'm French, and when I oh, sorry. yeah, I'm French, and when I came here to US, I was surprised to look back in history and and see that you know 50, 60 years before in the US there were actually you know tax code that were enable redistribution, yeah. and I always thought that you know the US had this kind of opposing view on taxation and wealth tax, etc. But it actually existed. So I wonder, you know, what changed? Yeah. That now you just say the word tax and you know, you're treated as a socialist or as a communist. So uh, just yeah. yeah, I mean, but that's basically what you're saying. They should go somewhere where, where kind of the center rules, right? At the time where we, where we kind of look at this, uh, neither nor ideologically neutral and uh, you're may, we are maybe hopefully making some better judgment as well, where reality is and what voters, uh, what voters want. France is, by the way, impossible to, uh, ask legislators for it. It's tried so many times, so many different people. Final question? What do we have? Yes, the final question. Sorry, uh, I actually have a two-part question. So uh, about choice set, I have a factual question and a theoretical question. So uh, is it the case that different countries in your survey have different policy manuals in terms of possible redistributive uh, actual policies being debated? Second question is, if you think about, so this is a theoretical one, if you think about demand, uh, it depends on the choice that the voters are given, right? So that choice is actually controlled by politicians themselves. So it's endogenous in the sense that I can see the dominant, dominant strategy is always played on the polar side. You always, as a left winger, always propose a lot of menu for redistributive policy so that voters pay more attention to, to this larger choice set so the demand would be higher, just in equilibrium. Whereas, so basically, uh, that's like a theoretical hypothesis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, to the first one, obviously, the the actual level of policy on you know, like redistribution is quite uh, stark. In the you know, we have Canada in there um, um, as as one kind of the bottom end, and then some of the kind of low countries on the other hand. I don't know how that would uh, affect uh, kind of their judgment. I'm not asking for more or less in that way, so I'm not sure whether we whether it will make judgment. And that's exactly where I think we're kind of going next with this question. Now we are just we we ask kind of very concrete policy proposals, you know, that were salient in the kind of public debate in each country. So in that way, we are trying to take care of that a little bit. Um, so you know, in so if in in some of the countries in Belgium, I think it was. We ask like increasing retirement rate. In other countries, we ask about um, increasing wealth taxation. Then we kind of scale that all afterwards. And so we have multiple questions to answer. It's issues they should know where the public opinion is on. And um, one way to get you know into a little bit into what is it actually causal. We did a placebo outcome placebo experiment where we used kind of the opinions or their ideology, their, their stances on redistributive issues to project uh, all other issues. And there was nothing there at least. So maybe that helps a little bit of like getting into uh, the question, you know, is it endogenous? Where is it coming from? Um, but I think the broader picture is, is to some extent, I think it is a plea that we think about representative democracy, not just in bottom up terms, 
any more from voters to uh, politicians, but a lot more about what politicians do and then how voters react to that in some ways. And, um, and I think that is, uh, that is, I think, where we need to do some more work. That note of small hope. <laughs> Let us thank uh, Christian Burning. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming, and we will see you next time. Thank you very much.